Welcome to the Dividend Talk podcast, episode number seven, analyzing dividend stock earning reports. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Dividend Talk. I'm your co-host, Engineer My Freedom, and as always, I'm joined with European DGI. Today, we just want to talk to you a little bit about second quarter earnings. Some great dividend stocks reported this week, so we thought we'd take a look at one or two of them and just give our thoughts on them. Besides this, we will look at some news, answer a couple of your questions, and provide our stock picks of the week. As always, we're delighted that you could join us today, and if you're new, please hit the like button and subscribe to us. We really appreciate it. Also, please feel free to check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Spotify. All of this with our own unique European flavor and more. See you on the inside. Hey, European DJ. I can't believe it's another week already. How are you doing, man? I'm doing well. Time is flying. Cucumber season has started, but not in the stock market. So yeah, I'm doing pretty well. <laughs> How about you? Good, good. Going on vacation tomorrow. Can't wait. Going camping for a couple of days and get to, get to, hopefully the weather picks up. It's, it's been raining all week, so I want a little bit of sunshine. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. So have, have you seen that in the news that stuck out or anything in particular? Well, uh, I think cucumber season is indeed a little bit st uh, started, but I don't want to uh, share a news article about cucumbers, although um, they're probably not straight anymore nowadays. I think that was in the past in the European Union. Um, what stood out probably was the stock market reaction also to the German GDP. It, it decreased by 10%, the worst since 1970. And economists, I think they expect a nine percent, so it's uh, it's one percent more. What it just tells us that this, if it's since the nineteen seventy, I mean, I wasn't born then yet, right? I'm from, mm. I'm from the eighties, the early eighties. So it just again, it tells me that this is the worst situation that I've ever lived in from an economic point of view. And the awkward thing is, if you don't work in an um, environment as an employee where you're impacted by a lockdown which i am not then it feels so surreal yeah, because i'm just doing my stuff i'm just doing it from home but i'm still working i'm still having my income so if, if let's say a large part of the society is in a situation like i am then it must be horrible for for people that are working in restaurants bars that were depending on that income and and that's just what i read when i see those figures so a 10 percent didn't impact me at all i didn't have a 10 percent contraction in my own gdp let's say at home but it probably some people had it 50 to 100 percent in their personal finance which i think is horrible and i hope it be re, uh, we will recover soon from it yeah the, the scary thing from a european standpoint is germany is is really the heartbeat isn't it it's the strongest yeah. economy we have so for that to be struggling for the largest decline it doesn't bode well for the rest of us and, and yeah. like you, I, I'm, I'm lucky enough like you, I, I haven't seen a decline as such. My, my business, my small cafes, I mean, we, we've been struggling and my wife has been out of work, but it hasn't really impacted us because there's been subsidies from the government and stuff. So it hasn't impacted me or any close friends yet. But I do believe is when the subsidies stop and, and we start to get back to normal life, we're going to see real devastating effects from this. Yeah. So those of us that are lucky to have jobs, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll keep them. Yeah. So then I believe your highlight from the week is probably related to more the recovery, right? Yeah, it, it's, it's, it's related to this COVID-19. We're kind of sick of talking about it at this stage. But one thing that kind of stood out to me was Britain now have 250 million doses potentially available for a vaccine that, that's not created yet. But they've been striking deals with... I think Sanofi and GSK were the, were the latest one. They struck a 60 million doses deal with them. Uh, Pfizer as well have 30 million. So, I mean, they, they are taking a proactive approach to this. They're getting ahead of the curve, getting in these vaccines for when they when they do become available. 
Um, and looking at Pfizer, they're confident they've been fast to go approved by the FDA, I believe, and they've been fast tracked through. So we, we could see a vaccine soon enough. I don't know how soon, but yeah. it, it certainly looks like they're making inroads on that. And for even a psychological standpoint, I think it'll be a good thing because people there'll be a vaccine out there and people will start traveling and, and maybe getting back to normal a bit quicker. So it, it's interesting in Britain. I'm not sure how Ireland stands up on this or even Europe. I know you mentioned mm -hmm. beforehand Europe have some sort of deal, but I know then that Sanofi are in talks with France for another potential deal. So yeah. it, 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 it'll be certainly interesting. I'm not sure how I feel on vaccines yet, but it'll be... So I'm actually, I'm not too optimistic about the vaccines itself, because uh, when I heard this Dr. Fauci talking the other day, and I heard this more often already, is that maybe there's only a 70% uh, efficacy, I don't know how you say it exactly, uh, that, it, that it responds positively in 70% of the people where it really uh, protects them. Mm. And from the other side, I hear, I read today somewhere in the news also that it might only last for a year and that we need to be vac vaccinated every year yeah so this just shows that um, it's it's tremendous and amazing what research can do in few months and how quickly they can uh, genetically almost engineer a, a vaccine but the, 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 it doesn't mean necessarily that it's over i do believe if many people get vaccinated of course then on top of social distancing i think we will see a rapid rapid decline of the virus but i think if I read all of that, that doesn't mean that we, that the virus will be gone. I think yeah. then in such case, people will still be impacted by the virus. We might still see some hotspots here and there. So then it becomes more like a question, how will we live with it as a society? Yeah. And I suppose from an investment standpoint and from, from our own, you have some companies there, which I know Sanofi are in, I think they're in the Nobel 30 index, yes. and you have yeah. Pfizer then that are another great big company. So if they get out of the curve and, and and they come up with a vaccine. I mean, it's not going to be free. It's, it's it costs a lot of money. It's only going to positively impact those. So, yeah. uh, looking ahead, they might be some of the companies to to maybe look at getting in now because they might rise rapidly if yeah. they do if they do get out ahead. So, that's that's kind of where where I'm thinking with that. But other than that, the, the news is was quite quiet. It's full of earnings reports again. Um, get my head stuck into them. So. Not not too much time scrolling through the news this week. <laughs> so so we'll just move on to the main topic if if that's okay with you. I, I know you've yeah, done definitely. you've done some um good work. So do you want to to lead? Who do you want to talk yeah, about? Yeah, I, I can start. Um well surprise, my my, my the first company that I wanted to highlight that reported earnings was Danone. So as you know, I'm quite a big fan of Danone and I bought some today, actually, full disclosure. I bought 26 shares at uh, 57 and a half euro because um, they had a quite a good earnings report and then the price dropped with uh, 6% or so. And that triggered one of my purchase orders. So as an investor, I'm typically having five to six purchase orders outstanding in my broker account. They are typically 10 to 15% below current market. Or when I when I schedule them, but always like uh, also 10, 15 percent under my uh, fair value estimation. So and then you have sometimes those lucky days like today that uh, a stock pops pops downwards, and then I'll pick it up uh, automatically, so I don't need to uh, focus too much on it myself. What was interesting, uh, and I think this is one of the reasons why the stock market responded so so heavy on this, because the sales were down. I think something like minus 3.6 percent or minus 1.1 percent on like for like sales depending on uh, again which uh, numbers you use but they had a really large impact on their bottled water packaged water business and due to the lockdown uh, people have just not been going to kiosks small shops restaurants where they just ask for a small bottle of water they earn really a lot of money with that a lot of revenue and the the big large packages of water that people were stockpiling on was not enough to um, compensate for that. So they lost a lot of uh, revenue based on that. 
And another one, what was really interesting in the earnings report is that in the quarter one, they benefited from stockpiling. So last week we made a little bit of a joke that in the, uh, that we thanked uh, the United States for stockpiling. So <laughs> now we should say like, hey, why did you stop? <laughs> because it impacted Danone's earnings uh, as well. Um, last, last but not least, I think also what was an impact here when you look at the profit in the end is that they had just higher costs in maintaining the supply chain. So you can imagine uh, if you now work in a, in, a, in a factory line and you need to wash your hands, do all the protective stuff before you can start up a line, it's just higher costs associated to it. Also, also with just opening up, inspecting, all this stuff just so they had some um, uh, costs related to that as well. Yeah. The good thing is actually that their dairy and plant-based uh, business unit grew with 3% and the nutrition uh, products also around 3%. So, uh, th and this is why I'm really actually invested in Danone because I'm, I'm a strong believer in, in, in the, the, the health-conscious trend that's going on, speci specifically in millennials. Mm. So for me, this is actually really nice. Okay, this water will restore. Yeah, the country opened up uh, again. Um, so I expect it a little bit uh, better going forward. And even if it comes, stays uh, hovering around a little bit, their their dividend is well covered. So I'm I'm totally not uh, concerned about that. What was also interesting for me was that the e-commerce grew with thirty percent, and it is currently already seven percent of sales. To your point in the last episode, we will see how how that will be in a few months from now when, when more, more and more things return even more to normal. Um, but it's good to see that such companies can quickly scale also into online channels. Yeah? And, and, and that's always, uh, for me, a question because if you're not prepared for it, you cannot even do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes. That owner. I like the results and I don't mind this little impact. It was expected for me some 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 drop somewhere so yeah you look you, know, you expect the sales to drop especially in the business that they're in with water and, and i think baby food and stuff so you, you would expect it, the sales to drop I, i'm not quite sure that warrants such a drop in the price i mean everybody knows the sales are going to be down so why why drop the price now but good for you you get to pick them up at a good price the the health section is, is quite interesting and it, it always fascinates me how whey protein is is so popular now and you know it costs basically nothing to make and they yeah. used to they used to throw it out like 20 years ago that that was waste and they used to throw that out and now the likes of glambi and then on they're making more money from that waste than they are from their cheese and and the manufacturing which which always fascinates me well you see they're really doing well for society they are recycling all this stuff from the past <laughs> <laughs> exactly What's your uh, what, what was your uh, company that you looked into from an earnings point of view? So it's one that I don't have at the moment in my portfolio, but it was, I think David N. Farmer on Twitter brought him up last week or the week before, and it kind of spiked my interest, but it was it was Pfizer, um, big pharmaceutical company, obviously. And they had, a, they had a pretty decent earnings report. So the, the biopharma revenue was quite strong. So it, it increased, I think, 6% which which is good they did have obviously some some headwinds there up john revenue declined by 31 but that was driven by a uh, low or loe of lycra that, that that performed dreadfully and their total revenue declined by nine percent which look as we said is, is expected the good news is i suppose they've raised their expectations so they've they've raised their revenue guidance by 0.1 billion and raised their eps by three cent which which is positive given not many companies at the minute are are given expectations they're removing all guidance so it's positive to see a company actually come out and say look we are coming out of this but performing a little bit better and raising their expectations a little bit i suppose the one thing that and i mentioned to it at the start in the news piece was it's their investment into the vaccine for COVID 19 could be a real driver for these here um i mentioned that they had an agreement with the UK for 30 million doses, but they also have up to 600 million doses with with uh, the US as well. So, I mean, they're kind of at the forefront of this. They're, they're, they're driving that along. They reduced their expenses as well, um, mainly because they reduced their marketing, sales and marketing costs. So 
they reduced that yeah. by about 17 percent and their earnings per share was down it was down two percent but i think last year they had a tax return in their favor so it was a once-off payment which it's not going to repeat again so all in all it was it was quite a strong report from them I, i'm quite bullish on them i'm, I'm going to look into them a little bit more i want to you know do a full analysis on them but there's certainly someone now that that's on my radar um and I, after that Aaron's report they'll probably go to top of the list for for me to uh, analyze next cool so I've, I've been looking at the company a few times in the past and i don't remember it correctly but i believe that haven't they maintained their dividend for a very long time and because there was hardly growth as a company it felt like a company and that was good in transition to to find new products let's say that they could sell in their portfolio is that still the case i see i, see, I haven't i haven't checked the dividend history um yeah. so just went through through the earnings but yeah. if you probably ask me that next week i'll probably know the answer to that because I, I, <laughs> I do plan on looking into them yeah. but they are, they are are they in a risk crash? I don't know. No, sure. no I believe that was the reason why it wasn't in there. They yeah. they held it stable for a few years, but look, they probably did. They didn't cut the dividend. Maybe I, I'm not sure, but yeah. it'll be um, interesting to to look at them and see. And I know Dividend Farmer. He's a great great guy on Twitter, very knowledgeable, and he swears by them. So yeah. that kind of gave me the impetus to to go and cool. and read them. So yeah. we'll see how it goes. So I also looked still in another company. So um, uh, UPS reported also earnings, and wow, the, the stock shot up with fourteen or fifteen percent. So I felt like, okay, I want to talk about that stock today. And um, I, I, I did some checking there, and actually, it was a, a very good report. And but more a report where I think that you. That you may expect such a pop-up from um, ups because these are headline numbers that looked really good and and this is always the interesting thing because when you really went into the into the details then the numbers were actually so 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 sales uh went up uh, quite a bit and i think with something like what was it 13 percent yeah 13.4 percent last week i spoke with microsoft uh, about microsoft they had a year over year growth of 13 percent so take that into context ups had a similar uh let's say percentage growth as microsoft uh, that that's already so awkward in my mind but okay <laughs> it, it just shows like how big this uh, sales volume growth was and it was mainly due to the united states because the b2c market business to consumer market had an increasement of 62 and a half percent in volume and this is huge it's explainable but what's so interesting if you look at the wowza the the world outside of the usa they only had an average volume growth of 9.8 percent now i think there are two 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 reasons for this big difference i think U ups is really a brand in america if I order stuff here, UPS is hardly ever an option. It's DHL, as an example, which is really, really big over here in Poland. So I, I do believe that UPS, and also from having been in the States a few times, is a much stronger brand. You see the, the vans everywhere there. That's not this, they don't have such a footprint here. Um, so their average average volume went up with 20.9 percent or something like that 22.8 percent in the us which is really large and also the majority of their of their revenue comes from the states so they did really great uh, great job there the interesting thing here is that the eps was lagging and 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 actually lagging the the revenue growth so you would expect sometimes that okay if sales is 70 percent up the eps will also at least jump with 70 percent but here you could see that it didn't do that so eps was just up compared to last year quarter two with 4.6 percent if you take the gap numbers if you take the non-gap numbers it will be 8.7 percent i have no clue why they put transformation costs uh, again out of the gap number uh, because all the companies that I worked, uh, the the big uh, hotshots always said, get used to it. Change is a constant thing. 
But then when I look into the balance uh, to the uh, to the annu annual reports, they always uh, move it out of the gap numbers to boost up the earnings and their bonuses. Also yeah. my bonus in the end. So, <laughs> um, But uh, the UPS spots a 2.85% uh, uh, yield here. What is interesting, I had a purchase order outstanding at uh, 90, uh, 90 or something like that back in March. It just didn't trigger it because it was for me heavily undervalued at the time. I, I sold some options at the time, so I've got uh, I made quite some profit on a, on a on a put that I sold. But um, so to sum it up, UPS, what was for me really why I think it's popping up so much because the last few times with around the December, they were not delivering. I mean, yes, they were delivering packages, but they were not delivering on the expectations. They had really issues with peak season. And they had really issues to uh, to staff it properly, and and sometimes packages were being laid. And now they've hit the hit the, hit the nail here. They really really did it well. And and this is why I think the price went so much up. They they showed that they can deliver under extraordinary circumstances. What I would like to at least know every listener about is that the issue with UPS for me, one of the biggest issues, is not so much Amazon that's entering the market, but I have a, somehow an issue that 18% uh, of their balance sheet is composed of pension liabilities. So for all the assets that they own, they have almost a fifth of that uh, driven on, pen uh, let's say, based on pension liabilities. And this was for me an issue because usually we lo look at long-term debt only, but if you add the pension liabilities to us, it's a really, really huge number. And every time when you go to an annual report, a quarterly report, and you just do control f on pension it's like really high number um and, and it's a big thing for the company and and the pension liabilities grew 20 percent compared to 2018 and 2019 so yeah it's yeah. quite a, quite a lot and i know we, sp we spoke earlier on it and it's I, I can't see how how somebody could do that or how you get away with it but it's 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 a huge figure like 20 percent. it's one fifth it's 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 yeah bad. so it, i think it's good to to highlight that because it's not something i would specifically look for in a balance sheet and, and maybe there's others out there that that wouldn't go that much in depth so it's good to to highlight that and make people aware of that what's their cash flow like i'm, I'm just looking at io charts there and they have yeah. a free cash a free cash flow payout of 103 percent which seems quite high. yeah so so but th this is this is why i'm say saying if you then start looking under the hood the numbers don't look so shiny because they're i <laughs> i put on the slide cash flow <laughs> i will change that to cash flow but uh, probably it's cash flow because it's uh, 3.9 billion uh in quarter two but last year they had 4.4 billion in free cash flow so free cash flow in year over year went down yeah uh, eps just grew with five percent while revenue went up with 13 percent so their operational efficiency is just not so strong uh, you know i saw that the price per piece has been dropping as well uh, and they, they they clarify for which reasons yeah and, mm -hmm. and i think this is one of, of of these are some of these reasons why their operational efficiency so i'm not talking about their logistics network but more like their their capital uh, i said uh, allocation and such it's not so it's not so top top uh, for, for a company as UPS that you might expect. Yeah, in interesting. That, just to keep an eye on from, from a dividend perspective, I mean, look, I, I look at cash flow and if it's yeah. considerably high all the time, it could be in danger. So it's, it's, yeah. I have, I have, a small, right. Yeah, right. I have a small position of UPS in, in my portfolio, not a, not a huge position, but it's, it's definitely something that I, I need to keep an eye on. Yeah, full disclosure. I'm not looking at buying here. Uh, if it would drop to 90, I might consider it again because then I've discounted also for all the liabilities that they have there. Mm. But at 140 or something like that, it's uh, not worth it for me. Yeah. Cool. Nice one. So the, the second company I, I kind of had a look at was ADP. Um, I know I wrote a blog post on them a while ago and they're a company that I, I quite like. And I believe that they dropped about six percent, six or seven percent today. And um, they had a, a nice little drop. But I believe that is because looking ahead, they are forecasting their revenue to decrease and their EPS to decrease over the next year or two. 
Um, so they're expecting a 4%, up to a 4% drop in in revenue and up to 18%, I think, in, in EPS. So yeah. it, it wasn't too great from them. Um, looking at this year, what they had, so it was their, I think it was their quarter four, actually, earnings that, that they gave. So they gave it the physical year as well. But their earnings overall were down, or the revenue was down 3%. Um, EPS was flat from physical year 19 to physical year 20, which is, look, it didn't go down. So that's, that's I suppose, a positive. Um, but looking quarter over quarter, revenues for the ES section was down 6%. Um, the PEO revenues were actually up 4%, which, which is positive. But look, it, it wasn't great. Um, as I said, looking ahead, they're, they're expecting up to lots of tailwinds, but I still think they're fairly valued. Uh, looking at the price, they're 137. They dropped six percent today. I, I, I think for me, that's that's within a buy range for me. Um, the four P ratio is just under 24, and they're, they're well covered by free cash flow. So I'm not too concerned. I, I know looking ahead, there's there's going to be some some tailwinds, and next year might be a little bit worse off than we are now. But I think that might present a better buying opportunity for some of us. Okay, cool. So, I mean, ADP, I need to really look deeper into it. It's on my to-do list. But you, I remember you inspired me with your stock uh, analysis. So I just, in general, recommend our listeners to have a, have a look at it. So I'll drop the link into the description. I thought that was a really nice uh, piece of work by you. Thank you. So I suppose that's that's all. I kind of looked at this week. Um, I know. Look, today is is Thursday, and there's big tech companies' earnings are out. So I would have liked to get to them, but we're both going on vacation. I think we deserve a holiday, so maybe we might touch on them a little bit next week. We'll see how it goes. Definitely. So moving on then to our next section. So this week we normally put out a post on Twitter, and normally on Friday, so I have a bit more time, a bit more leaning to work and. I was I was caught up today, so there's only a couple of questions. Um, so I'll ask you the first question from our, our listeners. It's from yeah. Let, Let Us Compound again, and he asked, "What do you prefer, fully invested or saving up for a big crash and then all in?" It's a good question. Yeah, and this was really interesting because I was with him in a bit of a conversation around where he mentioned, like it was in Dutch, by the way, on Twitter. He mentioned, like, okay, you know. I missed a little bit on the on, on on the drop in March because you know I was fully invested. It's not like you then have a lot of cash around. And I mentioned well, I had some cash around. So, and then this question popped up, and I think I would rather prefer to be fully invested because I, I strongly believe uh, time in the market versus market timing. If I think back I, in the beginning in 2015, I was saving up quite a lot of money. I was not investing everything. If And then, for instance, McDonald's at $90. All these stocks were so cheap. And this was four or five years ago. So I've been saving them that money as a war chest. I should have just got it to work you know, straight away. I, I guess I didn't feel so confident yet in what I was doing at the time. But knowing what I know now, I would be fully invested because if, even if you look at the big crash from March, it was probably 30% off from its all-time high. Yeah, but still two or three times higher than it was during the Great Recession. Yeah. So that that would be my answer, and I still have uh, some money to spend to 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 get my war chest empty. I will always have some money on the sideline. So to answer his question, maybe more specifically, I think I would typically always look at. Five to ten percent for these kinds of events of crashes, but not more than that. It's not worth it for me. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree. As you said, time in the market. We all know that quote, famous quote, and it's it's certainly true. But there is another side to this in that we are coming off the back of a pandemic, and if you were to start now, if you were just starting right now, maybe. It might be worth saving a little bit more and investing a little bit less. Still, still invest, yeah. but maybe switch switch the ratios around a little bit because we haven't yet seen the market. And we, we spoke about this before. We haven't 
yet seen the market correlate to what's actually happening in the real world. We've mentioned today about Germany. We all know the US are struggling. So that has to be that has to correlate back at some point. So if if you were to invest right now, would you if you were starting right now, would you go fully invested? Yes. You would yes. still go fully invested. Yeah, because since 2014 I've been thinking that the market was overvalued. Yeah. I've all the time had that feeling, so I was all the time reserved. And then I felt like, you know, how can it be that uh, companies are reporting um, uh, these bad earnings and valuations are so high? Why are valuations are so high? And then Trump gets elected. Hup, tax cut, Trump premium gets in, stocks rise 20%. And this is just what I learned, that uh, dollar cost, cost averaging is for me a better method because my enemy is my own psychology. Yeah, my, my enemy is that I think that all the time it's overvalued. And I think that now as well. For, for me, the the market should probably almost drop by 40, 50% before I get a feeling it's fairly valued. So that's my enemy in my head. Yeah. And so me personally would be fully invested. And that's what I'm doing already for quite some time, for a two and a half, three years now. Everything that is safe goes straight away into stocks. Yeah. And, and, but I'd still have some war chest from all that time that I save, and I'm now just overspending. I'm spending higher than I save to start emptying that war chest bit by bit by bit by bit. Yeah, yeah, and, and look, if you're dollar cost averaging, and like me or like you, if you're investing every month, you're going to catch it on the way up, and you're going to catch it on the way down, yeah. and you'd hope it'll, it will fluctuate over time. But taking taking out the dollar cost averaging aspect. If you were to just go all in right now, it's, <laughs> no, it's, no, it's, no, no, no. Okay, sorry. That's for me, like going to the casino, put everything on red twenty one. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's that. That's what my my thoughts was on that. And I'm not sure if that's where he's he's getting at with it. So I think dollar cost averaging is a no brainer. Yes, yeah. time in the market, you will average out over time. Yeah, going fully invested right now, probably not. I probably would. I mm -hmm. would ease money into the market and then. If and when a crash happened, I would swoop in with the rest of it. But no, it's a, it's, it's a good question and something that you could you could talk about a lot more. And I certainly see both sides. There's definitely there's definitely yeah. a case for both sides of it. Yeah. Very good. So the, so the next question then came from Doctor Investor on Twitter. This actually came last week, but we were yeah. after recording the episode before he wrote to me. Um, and the question was any opinion on Asian dividend stocks? No. Yeah, man, I, I, I'm just saying, I haven't, I haven't even looked at them. I know this might, have been <laughs> a good, this might have been a good question for Daniel that was on with us a couple yeah. weeks ago. He mentioned that he was he was investing in them, so yeah. he might be the man task, but I, I don't even look at them. <laughs> yeah, me neither. And I think it's home bias, right? And I think when I, when I read about American bloggers, I think they have that with European stocks often. Yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, now that you mention home bias, uh, the Sunday investor, I, I'm signed up to his newsletter every week, and it's it's fantastic. But he actually talks about that. He has a piece on that about home bias, and it's it's interesting. So I definitely recommend checking it out. And it's it's true because I suppose look, you're going to invest where you're more comfortable, aren't you? And if yeah. if you are if you are based in the US and you're based in Canada, why not invest there? I, I mean. I'm from Ireland. It's a little bit different because it, look, we're a nation of four million people. We don't have a lot of big companies here. All the big companies in Ireland are American companies. Mm -hmm. um, this whole thing with Brexit in the UK, we don't know how that's going to actually work out from an investing standpoint. So either way, I don't have much home bias. I'm moving towards more European stocks now. But like all the companies, everything surrounding me is US stocks. So it's companies that I know. Yeah. I mean so but i could tell you something there because i read the book one one up in wall street right and mm -hmm. it, it is really um about investing in stocks that you know and i started doing that also two three years more and more i mean i've got omega healthcare in my portfolio i have no clue where their rental properties are nothing it was influenced by um, reading a lot of Se seeking alpha articles on it, I did my own analysis, look good. I have no clue what this company is. I don't know how their logo looks like. 
And I started to shift away from that. So again, with Unilever and Danone, I use their products on a daily basis. Um, I've got also actually some non-dividend stocks like Facebook. Uh, I, I know Facebook. I know Instagram. Yeah. So I feel more comfortable with them. So I'm more and more shying away from companies that I don't know. And I rather focus on companies that I do know. And of course, I own some pharma companies and specifically the ones that create cancer products. Of course, I don't know their product because I, I, I haven't been a patient. Yeah, but I, I do I, I do follow the news here and those companies are in the news. So at least from a home bias point of view, I see it then more as a bit of a positive because I know what the general perception is about the companies. Yeah. Um, and, and that helps me already to to start looking into a company and then, then go into the data. But I will not do something again like Omega Healthcare. I will not do yeah. that anymore. But it, it's psychological as well, isn't it? If you think about it, if you had two companies and they had identical balance sheets, financials yeah. were exactly the same, and you knew one of them was Pepsi, what I'm drinking now, and one of them yeah. was some brand that you never heard of before, you would pick Pepsi. You would pick the yeah. brand that you know, and it's it's yeah. it is psychological. So th there is something in that. Stick to what you know. Stick to companies yeah. that, that that you know well, and you won't go too far wrong, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thanks for the question. That was an interesting one. Good, good questions. Look, two questions today. We, as I said, we didn't get to ask them, but they were there were good questions really get us thinking again so thanks very much so now on, on to my favorite part and that is your stock pick of the week yeah my stock pick of the week is um, again <laughs> a european company it's novartis actually i wrote a piece about novartis i think a few months ago i really like the company uh, like a big company uh, really one of those european companies that really did a good a lot of good stuff for society by just solving diseases almost uh yes there are some issues sometimes with the pricing you might also read that um, in the news but i just like a lot about the company and i saw that it's again quite nice in value zone the current share price is 76 uh, swiss franc and some change current dividend yield is 3.86 percent if, and there's always where we get the comments like okay but you pay a lot of tax uh, for swiss stocks yeah that's correct um and and i've shared my opinion on that a uh, few few times I, I feel like this is a good company now what's good to know is that if you look at their numbers it looks a little bit skewed so their payout ratio stands at 93 percent if you look at the eps numbers but if you go to the free cash flow numbers it's a 64 percent and this is always so difficult with pharma companies because if you look into pharma companies they do a lot of r d they usually uh, write it off the the field r d they, they usually write it off in the non-gap numbers and such so they have it's always hard to analyze it based on profit number and, and cash flow numbers are usually a better indicator for me for pharma uh, there. But if you look at the forward PE ratio stands at around 14 for a company that's growing quite quite well. So for me, it's currently around 16% undervalued. Um, the dividend growth has not been strong in the last decade, neither in the last five years. But what I have seen is now that the, um, let's say, there's more room for growth of, of the dividend again. And with the new CEO, I can see also that they are more and more becoming a data uh, company. And it's needed because in pharma, if you don't jump on the bandwagon of personalized healthcare, you might lose out on a lot of future business because this really at the moment deemed the, the future. And I think they have the right guy at the helm there that really understands this, that really understands data science. So yeah, that's my stock pick of the week. Cool. It's always good uh, to get a European flavor from you because I always go the US route. So it's nice to have a mix, I suppose. You're closer to the US. <laughs> <laughs> they fly in They fly in here a lot, so it's my excuse. <laughs> What's so, your stock pick? Uh, yeah, my stock pick this week um, was Walgreens Boots Alliance, WBA. And quite, quite excited about this company. I suppose one thing that I didn't know is that Boots, which is a big brand here in Ireland. I know they are in the Netherlands as well. You probably probably mm -hmm. use them as well. I never connected the dots, Walgreens, Woods, and I never connected that they were. I always thought it was American, just Walgreens everywhere in America. So it was, I was quite surprised to see they have a huge, like a pretty big international and European exposure. So they have, they have good exposure on that. 
they're, they're a, a massive, massive company. And an aging population, I suppose, throughout the world is always good in, in healthcare. And for me, they are they're massively undervalued. Like you look you look at their PE ratio, for example, it's six point nine eight percent. I have them twenty two point two percent undervalued at that current valuation. Their dividend growth over five years was six point five eight percent. That slowed down this decade. I know in the previous decade before that they had massive increases. There was the average yeah. was fifteen sixteen percent. So, um, at current price, their yield, their stamp yield is four point five percent. Their cash flow, but they're well covered by cash flow. I think it's thirty eight percent. I suppose the, the the big weakness for me is obviously COVID nineteen increasing costs, and the market is is highly competitive. But one good thing is that they are starting to move online a little bit more, especially in in the European space with Boots. Yeah. Boots Boots have a a pretty good online presence now, particularly in the UK um, and Ireland. Not not so much ever else, but it's it's getting there where you can. So, for example, in the UK, you can you can ring up and if you have a prescription or if you if you want to get something and. You'll get it the next day. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 the, their online presence is is getting good. So I, I believe the fear was also around Amazon, right? Um, uh, maybe uh, gobbling up some business from them. Yeah, look, Amazon are a beast, and they're, they're gobbling up a bit of business from everybody. It seems like, yeah. but I suppose that like these are, are massive in in the US. I think they're the market mm -hmm. leader in in their segments that they have the retail and the wholesale business so in the retail business i believe I, i'm starting to write a blog post on these so I'm, I'm looking at them a little bit more but i believe there's a walgreens within five miles of over 90 percent of the population so literally wow. everywhere. that that's incredible um so they're, they're literally everywhere so look amazon are going to take a piece of the pie there but i think there's enough growth yeah. in in europe there for them um, and one thing I will point out is that this is the first time I've used your template. We spoke about it on, yeah. uh, I think, two episodes ago we spoke about it and it's gone through. And it's, it's really helping me. I'm, I'm starting to go through and I think it's good for anyone that's listening to maybe have a look at that G sheet and go through because it's, it's, it just brings you through step by step and makes you think about companies a little bit differently to a, how I was thinking more methodical, I suppose. Um, and just helps me understand the business a little bit better. So thank you for that. <laughs> but um, yeah, that's that's my stock pick. I think the dividend diplomats still be happy with this because I believe it's on their watch list for July as well. So they they right. seem like a pretty good company. Cool. So I think this uh, brings us to the least nice part of the episode, right? <laughs> it's <laughs> can't believe it's that time already. It's, it's man, yeah. it just flies. It just yeah. flies. I suppose there's, there's there's two things that I want to mention. Um, we recently yesterday set up a Facebook group. There's there's nothing on it yet, um, but I'm going to drop a link to that. So if you're on Facebook, please just give us a like and start interacting with us. We'd we'd love to have you there. And the second thing that I'd like to mention is that we have this event coming up on the 22nd of August. We're not going to give away too much just yet, but it is exciting. So stay tuned for more information and keep that evening free is all I'll say. Yes, definitely. It will be fun. Okay, so then EMF, it was a pleasure again talking with you. And I really like these earning seasons uh, topics because it allows us to do some homework, really dig into the companies a little bit, go through the earnings reports, and I understand why Buffett likes this and why, why he reads so much, because it's just fun. I really like it. If it was your full-time job, imagine it would be it would be great. But there's, wow. just, <laughs> there's just so many. They all come at once, don't they? Yeah. I'd, I'd like one every week, I suppose, all together. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's it's like I have a small, relatively small, I suppose it's big, 39 stocks in my portfolio. So trying to follow all them is hard. Yeah. Imagine having 200 stocks or 300 stocks would be crazy wow. yeah but it like you know, it's, it's fun i enjoy it it gets you to understand companies it helps you understand balance sheets and cash flow statements a little bit better so i'm learning bit by bit as i go along and picking up it's it's um but look it's been interesting as, as i think we said last week 
we haven't seen an hour in seasons like this, so we might not see another one like this again. Exactly. Popcorn time. <laughs> well, thank you all for listening and uh, for hearing us rambling a little bit in the end, mumbling. Uh, but glad that you stick with us, stuck stuck with us. Oh, sorry for my English. I'm It's getting late here. Uh, I need a drink. So EMF, thank you. Listeners, thank you as well for staying around so, so far. And uh, see you next time. See you next week.